Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Throughout the years of filming Wild Kingdom, we were faced with the grim reality of extinction of some animal species. In the early 60s and 70s, animals were negatively impacted by the loss of habitat and the use of a chemical insecticide known as DDT. Today, DDT has been banned in the United States, and we've made great strides to preserve wide open spaces where animals can thrive. Wild Kingdom made a direct impact on modern captive breeding and release programs, and we're now seeing a positive comeback from many species. We must all do our part to continue this progress to protect all animals in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is Mutual of Omaha. Hello. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm sure nearly everyone has seen a kangaroo. It's a favorite in zoos clear around the world. But did you know that a kangaroo holds up the shield in the great coat of arms of Australia? He shares this honor with the emu, a large flightless bird similar to an ostrich. These animals are properly symbols of Australia because they're found no place else on Earth. Of course, Marlin, that's true of nearly all the animals found there. Most authorities believe that Australia was once connected to the mainland of Asia. But ages ago, perhaps 60 million years ago, it was cut off. And when that happened, it was though the clock stopped for all the animals that lived there. That's why we call them animals that time forgot. Elsewhere in the world, animals developed into more advanced forms. But Australia has remained a wild kingdom of primitive animals that live on much as they did in the days of the dinosaurs. They're actually living fossils. But I can assure you, they're more living than fossil, as I discovered when I set out to explore the bush country of Australia. Part of the time, I was accompanied by a little wombat who tried to adopt me. He has strong feet and sharp claws, and he's famous for digging long tunnels. The wombat is a miniature living fossil. Its prehistoric ancestors were as big as a hippopotamus. The most captivating of the fossils is the koala. Although he's often called Australia's teddy bear, he's not a bear at all. Like the wombat, he belongs to a more primitive order of mammals known as marsupials. That is, animals that carry their young in pouches. A eucalyptus grove is the place to find koalas, and there were quite a few around. Since they have no natural enemies, koalas have no fear. So I was able to climb a tree and pet a wild koala. They look like little toys nature created for the delight of children. Each wore the same expression, both solemn and perplexed. Their diet is highly specialized. They eat only certain kinds of eucalyptus leaves, about two pounds of them every day. Peace-loving and completely harmless, they live out their lives in the trees, maintaining a sure-footed grip with sharp claws and the ability to bring both the thumb and forefinger around opposite the other fingers. Moving through the forest, I came upon a kangaroo. Here's a creature at home both in the forest and the open plains. The 
The scientific name for the kangaroo family means long foot. And it's those long hind feet and legs with muscles like steel springs that can send them bounding 20 feet in a hop and reach a top speed of 30 miles an hour. The largest kangaroo is the great gray or forester. A young kangaroo is born blind and hairless and measures less than an inch. He immediately climbs into his mother's pouch and stays there for about three months. Then he begins to venture out to explore the world, but always ready to climb back in. Mother continues to baby him, but as he grows, the young kangaroo, called a joey, begins to assert himself. Powerful tail serves the kangaroo as a fifth leg when it's walking and as a stool when it's sitting. Scratching is a favorite sport. So is washing. And so is boxing. But this joy is no match for his mother who just hugs him tightly. He knows where to find the most comfortable place of all. Too bad a fella has to grow up. The wallaroos are somewhat smaller with shorter legs and a generally stockier build. Still smaller are the wallabies, but they're all kangaroos. Australia's bird population also fascinated me. The kookaburra steals eggs from other birds' nests, which is probably why these little wagtails are excited. The handsome Brolga crane is the only crane found there. Its nest is just a spot on the ground. The emu is the national bird of Australia and among all living birds is second in size only to the ostrich. The chicks are camouflaged with green stripes which disappear as they grow up. Oddly enough, it's the male that broods the eggs and assumes responsibility for taking care of the young. The most remarkable sight for bird watchers is the nighttime parade of the fairy penguin. Fairy penguins live mostly at sea. During the breeding season, the male and female take turns sitting on the eggs. And each evening, one half of the colony returns from feeding at sea to allow their partners to go out to feed. The nests are in holes which they dig in the sandy banks. They appear only at night. But with floodlights and high-speed film, we were able to record this remarkable performance. The fairy penguins are free to roam from island to island around Australia. But the little koala doesn't have that kind of freedom. He's found only in Australia and he can't survive without eucalyptus leaves. He's limited, both in environment and in diet.
Jim has an animal friend who's not from Australia, but from the woods of North America. And it's no stranger because it's the common opossum. He's unique because he's the only marsupial who still is found living outside the area of Australia. Yes, and way back during the last days of the dinosaurs, marsupials were common everywhere. But in the struggle for survival, they lost out to the more efficient mammals who bear well-developed young and therefore don't need pouches. But those advanced mammals never reached Australia. So the marsupials continued to thrive and evolved into a great variety of forms. One of the most fascinating of these many forms is the nearest Australian relative of the American possum, the family of phalangers. In a sense, phalangers take the place of monkeys which never reached Australia. They're well adapted to life in the trees, and some are even expert gliders. I was fortunate to come upon a group of ring-tailed possums, named for the white ring that's formed when the tail coils round a limb. A prehensile tail is really a wonderful aid in climbing a tree. The ringtails aren't gliders, but that doesn't keep them from moving about freely from tree to tree. Using his tail as a sort of built-in safety belt, he maneuvers about with the greatest ease and confidence. The brush-tailed possum is even more of an acrobat. The brush tail is quite adaptable. He'll happily devour leaves or insects, whatever's handy. Watch this, a giant possum? No, it's two brush tails. All the possums are marsupials. And here's another case of a youngster who's outgrown his mother's pouch. In fact, I'd say he's outgrown his mother. But she doesn't seem to mind his hanging on. This beautiful possum is called the golden brush tail. It looks remarkably like a kangaroo, doesn't it? So it's not difficult to see that the two are closely related. Another member of the large family is the pygmy possum. His tail is naked and quite short, but it's still mighty handy for climbing. With great good luck, I found a tree holding half a dozen flying phalangers. Watch this. The flying phalanger is also called sugar glider, and glide is what it does. Leaving the tree, it extends its legs to stretch out the folds of membrane attached to its body and legs. These remarkable gliders often sail a hundred yards before landing. Watch how just before landing, he banks upward to break his speed and land almost upright. Here is one of the true wonders of the wild kingdom. Another odd marsupial is the bandicoot. Because he's a digger, he's sometimes called a badger with a pouch but he looks more like a rabbit, and he runs like a rabbit. Prowling the forests and plains of Australia are the famous wild dogs, the dingoes. They are the great natural enemies of kangaroos and other animals. Dingoes are not marsupials. They probably reached Australia ages ago as pets of the first aborigines, and then reverted to the wild state. In the outback of the Northern Territory, I joined Ranger Dave Clark in pursuit of quite a different kind of imported animal. Wow. 
water buffalo were our quarry. Our assignment was to tag one, but to tag a buffalo you have to catch one. And to catch one, you first have to wear it down a little. The buffalo were brought in from Southeast Asia by early settlers as beasts of burden and as a source of meat. But like the dingoes, they've gone wild. To keep them from overrunning grazing lands, the population must be controlled. That's the object of our study and our chase. Experience has taught Dave to recognize when the animal is losing steam and when he feels the time is right, out he goes. She won't give up easily, but Dave won't give up at all. A wild buffalo is as wild as its name. If she weren't exhausted, we'd never be able to manage her. As it is, all we want to do is tie her up long enough to earmark her for study. That way, records can be kept of the herd's migration and steps taken where necessary to keep their movements under control. Dave looked about as hot as any man I've ever seen. But to him, it was all in a day's work. We've looked at a number of the lively, living fossils of Australia, animals that time forgot. But there are two mammals that are far more primitive even than the kangaroos in their kin, and much closer to their ancient reptilian ancestors. They're the world's only egg-laying mammals, the platypus and the echidna. The echidna looks like a hedgehog or porcupine. It's covered with the same sort of prickly spine but it's quite a different kind of animal, for the female lays an egg much like a reptile's. She takes the egg inside a pouch where it's hatched and where the baby spends its first weeks. The echidna has another name, spiny anteater. With sharp claws, it rips open a log to turn out its usual fare of ants and termites. A brush-tailed possum looks on as the echidna roots around with its long snout. Watch how that long tongue darts out and in, snatching up ants. It has no teeth. It simply crushes the ants against the roof of its mouth, then goes after more. I wasn't a bit surprised when he went for a drink of water, but I was surprised when he went swimming. I guess no one ever told him he's supposed to be afraid of water. More at home here is the Tasmanian devil who hunts the stream bed for frogs, crabs, insects, and other delicacies. Across the stream, the echidna faces a tough climb, but he pulls himself up by digging in with those powerful claws.
Up on top of the bank, the Tasmanian devil gets nosy. But he only has to get near those spines to realize that he'd better just leave them alone. But the echidna is taking no chances. Again, those powerful claws go to work, and he does a disappearing act. I followed the Tasmanian devil to its nest among the rocks. This is where the young ones are raised after they've graduated from mother's pouch. Yes, this is another marsupial. Scrapping with one another, the youngsters look fierce and savage. Their ears flush red. No wonder they're named devils. Actually, though, they're not as fierce as they look. And for this very reason, they're on the critical list of animals in danger of becoming extinct. The so-called native cat is not a cat, but still another marsupial. Like its cousin, the Tasmanian devil, it's carnivorous. A large blue-tongued lizard is the object of interest here. Like a true cat, the native cat employs a variety of tactics. But the lizard is no easy prey. The lizard seems to hold the offensive. But the native cat was merely waiting the moment to strike. The high point of my trip was discovering the den of a duck-billed platypus. Here, without doubt, is the oddest creature in all the wild kingdom. It's a fur-covered mammal, it has the beak of a bird, and it lays eggs like a reptile, and yet it feeds its young with milk. Water is its natural habitat, where it lives much like an otter. It has the same sort of thick, close hair. Its flat tail serves as a rudder, and its great webbed feet as paddles. As the platypus swims, its great duck bill is constantly sweeping the bottom or nuzzling in the mud for crayfish, tadpoles, worms, and grubs. It's a voracious eater, consuming half of its own weight or more every day. Observing the platypus, it's easy to understand why, when it was first exhibited in Europe, people branded it a hoax. The general feeling was, there ain't no such animal. But there is such an animal. Truly an animal that time forgot. Through the ages, in the absence of other competition, the marsupials of Australia have taken a variety of forms that closely parallel the more familiar mammals found elsewhere. Thus, the kangaroos are, in effect, marsupial antelopes. And in their habits and habitats, other marsupials take the places of cats, badgers, squirrels, moles, rats, bears, and even wolves. They're all animals that time forgot, fascinating as individuals, and collectively affording us a unique opportunity to peer through the veil of time back into the long ago of the wild kingdom. <laughs> ¶¶
The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.